Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News. Here's what we have in the bulletin. St. Elizabeth police on the hunt for eight detainees following jailbreak in Black River. Transport operators staged protests in St. James and Trelawney. And later in sports, Reggae Boys ends European camp with defeat. Thank you for joining us. I'm Shamela Pullen. Here are the details. A manhunt is now on for eight high-risk detainees who escaped from the Black River Police Station this morning. The men are charged for murders, robbery, rape, and illegal gun possession. More in this report. Citizens in St. Elizabeth are being urged to be on the lookout for eight men who escaped from the Black River Police Station Monday morning. They are Anwood Hines and Javon Sims, who are both detained on murder charges. Oral Cole, Richard Brown and Alric Hutchinson are facing charges of robbery, while Dean Simpson was detained on robbery and rape charges. Dewar Williams and Kenneth Stewart were also in custody for illegal possession of a firearm. Reports are that four men were seen walking on Central Road in the Black River area in the wee hours of Monday morning. A report was made to the police which prompted a check of the cell block that houses the detainees when eight of them were discovered missing. It's believed that the men used a sharp object to cut through the ventilation grill in the cell. On Monday morning, when our news team arrived on location, officers were seen outside. Notably, the Black River Police Station has several cameras around the building, but up to news time, we were unable to see whether they were functional and if they were being used to assist the police in their investigation. The officers, however, are urging citizens not to harbor the men. Jamila Maitland, TVJ News. A group of transport operators are livid over poor road conditions between St. James and Trelawney. They took to the streets to voice their grouses. Aisha Nation reports. From as early as 6 Monday morning, taxi and bus operators took to the streets from content in St. James to Wakesfield in Trelawney. The transport operators pulled their services over poor road conditions. The road alone for months ago to Orange turn we have much less when you go further up to that side where it's like common, it's like common we are driving us so, on some pasta, some, some bad road. For the last 15, 20 years, we don't see anything going on on the road. Eight, nine, ten years ago, them say seven dollar come on for gas to help fix the road, and we don't see nothing. So we fed up. We just withdraw our service because we need someone to come represent. We say, oh, okay, we're going to do something. As little rain fall, you know, even if it fall for, for you know, two, three hours, just a half hour, and especially down here, so now where we are standing, flood out. We cannot, we cannot operate freely. The road is in a deplorable condition, number one. Number two, as it, as it, as it rain, we flood out. And when you drive your vehicle through, through water, you know what that gives. This has impacted commuters, especially students, going to school. But the protesters say they have no choice as it's costing them too. Year in, year out, we have to keep replacing parts, front-end parts, and it's not cheap. When me, I have to service my front-end and my bus. If me not have at least $60,000, me can't touch it because the, the parts, them are very expensive. I may have to do that like sometime, three times for the year. Meanwhile, Head of Operations for St. James Superintendent Aaron Samuels says while he doesn't have a problem with the protest, it is affecting how the police respond to other incidents in the space. When it affects the free flowing traffic, we have a problem here. So what we are trying to do is to get them to clear the roads of their vehicles so that the traffic both lanes can flow freely, um, that persons can reach to work and reach home quickly. I had to remind them that, you know, they were saying that they, in case of emergencies, it will be hard based on the road conditions. So I remind that they are making it harder. But TVJ News understands that the protest continues. Aisha Nation, TVJ News. 
At least one attorney is this afternoon questioning the motive of the political directorate in the ongoing war of words with the Integrity Commission. Speaking on Radio Jamaica's That's a Wrap on Sunday, attorney at law Nicole Gordon says alarm bells are sounding off over the tit for tat. Details in this report. The Integrity Commission has been chided by several members of Parliament over its handling of investigations into allegations of corrupt practices. The Commission is charged with providing and enhancing standards of ethical conduct among parliamentarians and public officials. Attorney at Law Nicole Gordon says alarm bells are going off when the people who are to be abandoned by the standards are the ones complaining about them. Our parliamentarians really need to be careful about how it is that they're going about what they're doing. The fact of the matter is a decision was taken and a good decision was taken that we needed laws to prevent corruption. We needed laws to promote integrity. And if it is that we're having this sort of, it's the stridency and the way in which it's being done, then you wonder, what is the problem that you have with the promotion of integrity? What is the problem that you have with the, this matter of the standards that are being set? Why aren't you signing the code of conduct when it appears to be a, a, a really simple document that sets out a code that you should be following anyway? What's the problem? Meanwhile, President of the International University of the Caribbean, Reverend Dr. Roderick Hewitt, has called for the institutions that are to provide supervision to be protected. A joint select committee of parliament is examining the Integrity Commission Act with a view to making changes. Prime Minister Andrew Honus has called for the committee to expedite its work. Dr. Hewitt says for democracy to function, there has to be accountability, particularly when people have been given instruments of power to act on behalf of others. Once that group of people, the law set them aside as an oversight group, they must be protected and protected from those who may also want to see it being weakened for whatever reason. Just like how we have the courts and the courts must act in an independent way and do their job and to be held accountable, the same is true for the Integrity Commission. Oshane Masters. TVJ News. It's time for a break. Stay with us. More stories when we return. Welcome back to the Midday News. A targeted intervention is expected to help address crime in Canterbury St. James. A series of development workshops geared towards building resilience have started in the area. Sandy Williams reports. The tourism sector of Montego Bay in St. James has been populated with pockets of informal settlements for years. For Member of Parliament for South St. James, Homer Davis, this is because people from other parishes have migrated to the space for the sake of job opportunities in the tourism sector. If you look at, for example, Flankers, Flankers came about as a result of the development of the Sanctus International Airport. If you look at how the informal settlement develop and emerges, it's because of our hotel industry. We're offering things that St. Elizabeth don't offer. The majority of them consist of lawful, law-abiding citizens who contribute to the GDP, who pays their taxes, and are making an appeal that we need to visit some of these communities in order that the necessary infrastructure can be put in place so we can offer better policing, we can offer better fire service, we can offer better garbage collection. Mr. Davis believes that this could transform the inner city communities into more resilient spaces. So far, the community of Canterbury is expected to benefit from a series of community development workshops which officially started on Wednesday. The project is geared towards strengthening the community's resilience as a public space. Through a collaborative effort between the Sanders Foundation, the United Nations Human Settlements Program, and the St. James Municipal Corporation, a multi-purpose community center will be established in the area. 
The planned development project will also include a green public space. The public space will be designed with innovative nature-based solutions to delay and contain rainwater, improve the biodiversity and provide natural shade to create enjoyable spaces for social gatherings and events. The community centre will be managed and owned by a community social enterprise and in partnership with public entities develop skills training and capacity building targeting youth, women and vulnerable households. The design of this space will be developed through participatory methods using Minecraft. The project is expected to provide opportunities for young people in Canterbury to develop their capacity to change the community's crime-afflicted reputation. Even though we don't have no murder in, Flang in Canterbury for a while, the trip advisor is still mentioned that Canterbury, you stay far. Hmm? It's not good. It's not good. And we have seen the transformation of communities right across Jamaica. Nine workshops have been scheduled from June 14 to 28 and will be held at different locations to allow residents to pinpoint issues they want to see addressed in the community, such as flood mitigation and security. Sandy Williams, TVJ News. It's now time for the Business Minute. Jam Process plans are in place for the fourth installment of its flagship export development program, Export Max 4, to begin in September. The program is geared at developing a cluster of export-ready companies by enabling them to be competitively positioned to take advantage of opportunities on the international market and increase export earnings. Jampro's interim vice president of exports, Shane Angus, told GIS that Export Max 3 is now in its final phases, with plans far advanced for Export Max 4 to begin in September. Mr. Angus said the first phase is to get a consultant to do the intake management and develop a framework for which Jampro will send out a call for companies. In order to be eligible for participation in the program, Companies must be formally registered with the company's office of Jamaica, with majority Jamaican ownership, have been in operation for at least six months, and have an export-ready product. Further afield, Goldman Sachs analysts have cut forecasts for China's economic growth, citing persistently weak confidence and the cloud over the property market as stronger-than-expected headwinds. The U.S. investment bank lowered its full-year real gross domestic GDP growth forecast for the world's second biggest economy from 6% to 5.4%. It also lowered its 2024 growth forecast from 4.6% to 4.5%. And that's it for the Business Minute. I'm Oshane Masters. Time now for the top regional and international stories. In the region, an Ecuadorian woman has died days after mourners at her funeral were shocked to find her alive in her coffin. Bella Montaya, age 76, was first declared dead by a doctor at a hospital in the city of Babahoya last week. But when mourners attending her wake heard her knocking on her coffin, she was immediately rushed back to the same hospital for treatment. After seven days in intensive care, Ecuador's health ministry confirmed she died on Friday from an ischemic stroke. On the international scene, on Monday, North Atlantic Treaty Organization Chief Jens Stoltenberg said the military alliance will not be issuing a formal invitation to Ukraine at the group's high-profile summit in July. He made those comments during a joint press conference alongside German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. Mr. Stoltenberg said consultations are ongoing regarding Ukraine's bid to join the NATO, adding that member states have to agree when the time is right. And the bodies of hundreds linked to a death cult were on earth from a mass grave in Kenya. CNN reporters traveled to eastern Kenya to speak with escapees and former pastors of the cult and found that its members suffered from starvation. An ex-cult member called the area the wilderness, a remote area of Kenya where their leader lured his flock. The dead were still being on earth when reporters arrived at the scene where forensic teams worked to remove the members of the death cult from shallow graves. There have already been 300 people on earth from the graves and many of them are children and most showing signs of starvation. And those are the top regional and international stories. I'm Karen Simpson. 
We head to a quick break. When we come back, we'll have your midday sports report with Jordan Fort.